we'll talk about the chemotherapy. Uh, let me ask Diane with regard to deciding whether your patient should get hepatic-directed therapy or a systemic therapy. Do you have any criteria that you use, or how do you, how do you make that decision? Yeah, absolutely. So um, one of the challenges of, with our disease is it's, it's quite heterogeneous. So as uncommon as our cancer is, um, the, the pattern and behavior of the disease can, can be quite different for each patient. And so uh, typically, um, as we discussed, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors seem to be much more sensitive to some of the treatments that I have available to me in, in terms of systemic treatments as opposed to the so-called carcinoid or extrapancreatic neuroendocrine tumors where my treatments systemically are quite limited. Um, so in a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, I feel pretty comfortable um, using some of my systemic therapies, particularly, for example, if a patient has had their primary removed and they've undergone a Whipple procedure, for example, um, the risk of embolization and the potential abscesses thereafter is high. So that patient, for example, I would opt to choose a systemic approach prior to a regional approach in that situation. Um, in addition to that, for the um, functional patients, I really try to uh, start right away with this medicine and analog because I know that that treatment really did revolutionize the way we take care of these patients with the functional um, tumors. So that is something that I would start right away and, and often keep on for the duration of the treatment with those patients. So I think it does, in fact, uh, certainly depend on the burden of disease as well, as you explained. So in a patient with, for example, greater than 75% of their liver full of tumor, uh, doing an embolization on them could be potentially quite toxic in addition to being dangerous. So that patient, unequivocally, I would try for a systemic agent, particularly if they had pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. So, Rada, let's say you have a patient that has liver disease and, and you go in and you resect the liver disease. Is there any role for systemic therapy after that? That is something that we are very excited about because um, with some of the trials that we're going to discuss uh, showing some impact on progression-free survival, um, as in with many diseases, where first you start out with unresectable disease and see if you have a signal there with some type of therapy, then you start moving back into actual adjuvant settings. And to date, we don't really have any adjuvant data for complete resection, and uh, we do not consider that there's any role for a somatostatin analog or any of the newer targeted therapies. But we are going to be starting a trial this year uh, with Dr. Stephen Labuti as the principal investigator in which patients who do have an R0 resection, meaning all gross disease in the liver is removed, or even an R1, which allows these positive margins of enucleation that I was talking about, uh, will be randomized to get uh, everolimus therapy or not. And we're very excited about conducting that trial. Interesting to see what the results of that very interesting. may be down the road. Yeah. So in, in a patient then, uh, let's say they are not great candidates for hepatic-directed therapy or surgery, uh, there, there does seem to be a role for traditional cytotoxic chemotherapy in patients with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. That differs a little bit, perhaps, from the carcinoid tumor patients. Uh, I want to turn to John. You have been one of the, the leaders in, in looking at some of these regimens. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the activity of cytotoxic chemotherapy in pancreatic sure. net? So there aren't any uh, large uh, randomized placebo-controlled studies of cytotoxic chemotherapy, but there's accumulating data both from prospective phase two uh, as well as from retrospective series suggesting that certain regimens, alkylating regimens, uh, can be quite active. Uh, Streptozosin-based regimens uh, traditionally, and more recently there's been a lot of data on temozolomide-based regimens, including capecitabine and temozolomide where we reported a response rate in the first-line setting in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors of uh, 70%. Um, patients who are probably best candidates for cytotoxic chemotherapy are patients with relatively aggressive tumors, uh, patients with high volume disease in the liver, um, patients with a KS67 probably in excess of 5%, although that hasn't really been uh, looked at carefully, uh, and patients who are symptomatic, um, in which case you really want to obtain a, a response rate. Um, and uh, the response rates that we see with chemotherapy tend to be quite a bit higher uh, than response rates that we see with some of the targeted agents. And in, in selecting patients for chemotherapy versus other approaches, are, are there criteria that you use uh, that would suggest one approach is better than the other to start off with? Well, I think we need to uh, do a better job identifying prognostic factors for selecting of therapy and sequencing of therapy. Personally, I tend to choose patients with relatively high volume disease and patients with uh, disease that's progressing or that um, where, where the mitotic activity or K, uh, K67 activity is a little bit on the high side. And I don't, you know, 
I don't limit myself necessarily at 20%, which is strictly the speaking the cutoff between intermediate and high grade. We've seen patients with K67 ranges uh, well into the 50, 60% range uh, that respond quite well to temozolomide-based chemotherapy. Patients with higher, uh, more aggressive disease, as Diane said earlier, um, small cell carcinoma, those tend to do best with uh, platinum-based chemotherapy. But it tends to be the patients with uh, slightly more aggressive tumors that respond most quickly uh, to cytotoxic chemotherapy, but it could be that patients with indolent tumors uh, can do well with chemotherapy as well. Um, it just needs to be studied uh, more rigorously, and uh, eventually uh, there need to be studies comparing cytotoxic chemotherapy to targeted agents. One exciting thing along this line that we've been able to do, Matt, is we've had patients who at presentation are not candidates for surgical debulking, and then we've, uh, in our multidisciplinary approach, uh, we've asked the medical oncologists to treat them with capecitabine and temozolomide for a period of time, and given the high response rates, we have converted a considerable number of these patients from uh, not being candidates for debulking to actually being very excellent candidates for debulking. That's a good point, and it's not just liver debulking, it's even uh, patients with locally advanced disease. For the um, primary resection. You, you can, with neoadjuvant chemotherapy, convert them from uh, unresectable to resectable. So I, I'm hearing a consensus that there really does seem to be real activity with, with some of these chemotherapy regimens in pancreatic. Now, Diane, your experience is similar? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, we've had a couple of uh, primary pancreatic tumors that were um, considered unresectable, and we've given that uh, combination, and they've been rendered free of disease, some of them a couple of years. So, um, and, and it's well tolerated as treatments could go. So, um, you know, the, Temidar is an alkylating agent, so I typically, um, even though John's study was so striking and that the median progression-free survival was 18 months, in my own practice, I typically don't extend it for longer than a year just because of the rare but serious risks that al alkylating agents can have on the bone marrow. Um, but it's, uh, you know, as oncologic therapies go, it's, it's pretty exciting how well it can work for our pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. I think we need to emphasize that this is really, um, the studies really up to date have been in pancreatic.